Hi, good morning. My name is Shivam Desai. I'm one of the hip and knee doctors at Georgia Bone and Joint. And I wanted to touch base with you guys about one of the most common symptoms that I see routinely in my office, and that's treating hip and knee pain. So a little bit about me. Um, I do a lot of driving. So I go to our offices in Union, Peachtree City, uh, Griffin, eventually Fayetteville. Um, and I have privileges at multiple hospitals, Piedmont Union, Piedmont Fayette, our surgery center, um, as well as uh, Cancer Center Treatments of America. Uh, I grew up in Greenville, South Carolina, but you know, I did come back to Newton quite a bit growing up as a kid. I went to school at Duke and went to medical school in Charleston, South Carolina at MUSC. I did my residency training in Baltimore, Maryland um, at uh, University of Maryland Medical System. It's a really high volume center and it kind of got introduced to the beauty of joint replacement surgery at that time. And then my wife and I had the privilege of spending a year, uh, 2020, abroad in Australia um, at Flinders Medical Center, which uh, was a really good opportunity for me to learn more about some of the you know, international trends of joint replacement surgery and pick up some really valuable techniques that I can implement back home here in Unit. Um, and I have no relevant disclosures for this talk today. Um, so the outline for what we're planning on discussing starts out with understanding joint pain what it is, why people start to develop this joint pain, different treatment options, both non-surgical as well as surgical, um, uh, joint replacement surgery um, in itself, the different uh, techniques and you know, instruments that we may potentially use to facilitate that process, and then the recovery process, including expectations. And at the end, you know, we'd like the opportunity for you guys to submit any questions um, on Facebook or in the comments section. So your joints are essentially involved in every activity that you do. And that's the same can be said of multiple, multiple joints, your back, your hips, your wrists, etc. But the reason hip and knee are so common, hip and knee problems are so common, is that they're our biggest load bearing joints. And so it's one of the most common issues, one of the most common um, uh, problems that we tend to see uh, in our clinics. And there are different causes of joint pain. So one of them can be inflammatory type pain. So patients with rheumatoid arthritis, lupus, inflammatory disease, it's a different process than normal wear and tear um, osteoarthritis. So with rheumatoid inflammatory disease, the body attacks its own cells because it thinks that its own cells are a foreign invader. And so an inflammatory process, it's really important to try to get the medical management as the priority. When the medical management is optimized, sometimes we still have to do surgery afterwards, but you know, the goal is kind of getting, us pl getting patients plugged in with the rheumatologist um, and try to decrease the need for further surgery. Um, normal osteoarthritis is the most common presentation of osteoarthritis for hips and knees. And you know, that basically means that over time as we age, the normal cartilage, the normal lubricating lining in our joints tends to wear off with time. Um, and we know that people that have very active lifestyles, people with a little bit more weight, they tend to wear out their cartilage sooner than other folks. And then post-traumatic arthritis, I see a lot of this as well. Anytime you've had a fracture near a joint, there's a possibility that some of the cartilage and the joint surface can heal in an uneven or a less than ideal position. We call that post-traumatic arthritis. And so sometimes people have hardware near their joints. Sometimes people have, um, you know, a step off in their articular surface. That, it's a more complex operation, but you know, now we, we all have the skills and the, and the, uh, the tools to um, really treat those patients the same way. So from a non-surgical perspective, we do have a lot of options. Walking aids are a good first way to start, you know, whether a cane or a walker. This doesn't reverse the arthritis, but it does help people symptomatically from the get-go. And most importantly, when people are in a lot of debilitating pain, we try to ensure that they don't have falls. And so walking aids can be a good first line treatment early on. Heat or cold therapy generally can be very beneficial around the hips, around the knees. We generally don't recommend both. It's generally one or the other. Some people tend to like heat, some people like tend to like uh, cold um, just as well. Physical therapy is all can often be very beneficial. You know, strengthening the muscles, the ligaments around the joint can help you offload the diseased areas of the joint surface as well. And then anti-inflammatories, those can be very beneficial as well. Over the counter, ibuprofen, 
Motrin and that class of medications do not reverse the arthritis, but they can address your pain. And for a lot of patients, these things can you know, accomplish what they need from an early onset. And a lot of patients can avoid surgery altogether, and that's always the goal. So the question is, how do I know when I need a joint replacement? So joint replacement is an elective operation, but we only like to consider joint replacement once we have exhausted all non-operative modalities. And so the questions that you really need to ask yourself is, is the pain affecting your ability to sleep at night? That's usually the first time people really come to me asking about a total hip or a total knee. You know, is the pain so bad that it's preventing you from doing the things that you want to do? Are you becoming less active? Are you not able to spend time with your family, spend time with your kids and, you know, go on walks and hike, things that you like to do? Um, and then steps, you know, steps are all can definitely be a, very burdensome if you have end-stage bone-on-bone osteoarthritis. And so I wanted to start out talking about total hip replacement. And so, you know, we'll start out with the basic anatomy of the hip. So the hip is a ball and socket joint. And so, you know, the acetabulum, that's the socket we're discussing. And then the ball is the femoral head. And so the, over time, the cartilage between those two bones wears off, as you can see in this demonstration. The goal of the hip replacement surgery is to resurface those diseased portions of the tissue. And we do that with, uh, oh, this is just an x-ray of a normal hip on the right, showing, showing that normal ball and socket contour, and the loss of that ball and socket contour with the bones you're touching in the arthritic hip. And so the total hip replacement is the most successful operation in the history of medicine. It's greater than 90% success rate. Um, and that's because you know the hip is a it's a fairly mobile joint we have a lot of soft tissue covering the hip um, and so even though we are doing well with it we're always looking for ways to get even better and get even better results and we're doing these procedures on younger patients we're doing them on, on older patients as well so a little bit about how it works you know exactly like I said the goal of the operation is to remove the diseased portions of the cartilage and replace them with, uh, with metal implants, as well as a liner for those to articulate together. And this is becoming increasingly common within the United States um, as the need for these total hip replacements goes up year by year. So this is a post-operative x-ray of a, a total hip replacement. Obviously the patient had the right side performed. You can see metal in the femoral canal, as well as in the acetabulum, and then a new ball. So the, the bone on bone is no longer articulating. And you can compare that to the non-operative side where there's uh, clearly no metal um, and the patient has reasonable joint space on this side as well. And like I said, the particular implants, you know, the, the stem, the portion that goes into the thigh bone, the femur, is generally a titanium alloy. And this material helps the bone grow onto the surface. And this is the, the head that replaces the normal femoral head. And then the acetabular cup is a titanium kind of sticky material that helps the pelvis grow inside to get excellent fixation. And so it ends up being a ceramic head articulating with a plastic liner. Um, and that has proven to be one of the best long-term um, uh, combinations with regards to wear rates. And so there are different types of ways to get to the hip. Um, you know, I perform every hip approach and there are pros and cons with every single hip approach. And I just want to touch base about a couple of the major ones here in the United States. The posterior approach is sort of the standard, you know, hip, hip operation approach. It is generally done with the patient on their side. And there are definitely pros and cons to this approach. You know, the benefits of this procedure, of, of this approach is that you get better exposure and oftentimes it's safer in patients that have a bit, little bit larger body habitus, as well as in you know, complex cases where you need to have the ability to be a little bit more extensile. The con is some studies have shown that there's a slightly increased dislocation rate with, uh, with posterior total hips. And the dislocation is basically when the ball that we talked about pops out of the socket. I also perform direct anterior approach hips um, direct anterior approach is, is another really well-functioning approach. Um, the benefits, it involves a very small incision, so it very, very much facilitates a rapid recovery. Most of the studies show that the anterior approach 
improves the recovery rates uh, after a total hip replacement by about six to 12 weeks. After about 12 weeks, the posterior hips and the anterior hips do about the same, but you know, we're always looking to get better and you know, improve the patient's recovery. So this is, it's a good approach. Um, and most importantly, it reduces the chance of dislocations after surgery, uh, more so than the posterior approach. There are definitely some, some disadvantages like, like anything in life. And this approach has slightly increased wound complications slightly harder exposure as well. So it's a slightly hard, more difficult operation, which can be challenging in, uh, in bigger patients. So next up, uh, I wanna talk about probably the second most common operation that I do is the total knee replacement. And you know, what, cons what constitutes the knee? You know, up top we have the thigh bone, the femur. At the bottom we have the, the shin bone, the tibia and they articulate, and they articulate with cartilage, so it, it's not bone on bone rubbing up against each other. And you can see that on this disease portion, uh, where you, the red kind of denotes the loss of cartilage over time. Again, that can be because of inflammatory disease from rheumatoid arthritis, it can be because of normal wear and tear osteoarthritis, or it can be because of post-traumatic arthritis. And another x-ray just showing what a healthy knee looks like, you know, the thigh bone, the shin bone, the tibia, good joint space between these bones, which again represents cartilage. And you can see on this diseased arthritic knee, these bones are touching. And even on the outside, the lateral aspect, this person is starting to develop osteophytes as well. Every patient that comes to my clinic gets this spiel about weight loss because most biomechanical studies show that every pound on our frame is five, four to five pounds at the hips and knees see. So even a small amount of weight loss can really improve the joint reactive forces uh, going through our major joints. So total knee replacement, how does that work? Very similar to the idea of the total hip. You know, we don't replace the whole hip, quote unquote, we resurface the diseased portions. And so the areas where we had diseased cartilage, we replaced with metal as well as plastic. You know, on the right, that's an example of a partial knee replacement. On the left is an example of a total knee replacement. Um, you know, a, a good time to do a partial knee replacement is only you know, is when there's only one focal area of cartilage loss. But if the whole knee is diseased, then that's a good opportunity to do a total knee replacement. And again, you know, we said the thigh bones, the femur, the shin bones, the tibia, and we've resurfaced, resurfaced the caps of both with metal and they articulate with a piece of plastic called polyethylene. And these are just the various stages of arthritis um, and where the different um, zones of arthritis can occur. And these are post-operative x-rays and on the right is you know the partial knee replacement you can see that this is limited to just the inside portion of the knee and the patient is able to preserve their native bone on the lateral side and this is an example of a post-operative total knee replacement where they've had their entire cap of their femur the entire cap of their tibia replaced you know, like I said, even though total hips and total knees have done very well, they're very successful operations. In orthopedics, we're always trying to get to get better and we're trying to push for rapid recovery. And that really, um, you know, instigated the role for technology. And so probably, you know, my favorite tool in, in everything that I do is the, uh, the Mako Smart Robotics Solution. Um, and it's really been a game changer for my pa for all of our patients here in joint, Georgia Bone and Joint, and uh, there's a lot of data to support its use. So, you know, the Mako total knee replacements, you know, like I said, we're trying to get better and better. A lot of these studies are showing that our folks are having less pain, faster recovery, much sooner than the traditional way we would do um, uh, manual total knee replacements. Hip replacements have always generally done well, but the robotic assisted total hip replacements, we know that we have a more accurate placement of the implants. And for me, I think it makes me a better surgeon because I know where the implants go, but I have the robot kind of confirming that they're going in the right position every time I do the case. So it produces a more reliable, a reliable outcome. And more, most importantly, there's a very good track record with using this, right? It's no longer experimental. Lots of studies are supporting its use. It's been around throughout the world really for greater than 14 years. And again, most of my robotics training happened in Australia because you know they really love to adopt evidence-based medicine down there. Um, and it's not available throughout every portion of the country quite yet, but I'm certain that within the next few years, it 
will become the standard of care. So how does it work? So this is a fancy video of the uh, uh, of our maker robot, and we start out by coming up with a CT scan of the patient beforehand, and it gives us a personalized surgical plan. Only you, this plan is unique to you once you get your CT scan, and it tells us how many millimeters that we need to resurface during the operation. While you're asleep, we then you know, take the minimal amount of bone necessary to give you a stable, effective total knee replacement. And during surgery, we can even check the gaps to make sure, you know, the gaps are within a millimeter of what we want um, to produce a stable pain-free knee. And then finally, we put the implants in exactly where we plan to do based off of our robotic plan. You know, recovery from joint replacement, it's a long process, it's not easy. But you know, like I said, 80 to 90% of patients are very happy and glad that they had the operation done. You know, you, we usually do the surgery either, either at our outpatient surgical center or at the hospital. And patients either recover at, a, at home or at, at a rehab center. But the trend over the last five to 10 years has been to, to, to send patients home because our post-operative recovery has gotten better, our surgical technique has gotten better, which has been pretty cool. You know, we tend to follow our patients, you know, six weeks, 12 weeks, and up to a year. I like to see my total joints back on a yearly basis, but a lot of patients are doing well and they call me and they say, do I really need to come in? I'm doing fine. And so, you know, for those patients, I make a special excuse, but you know, yearly follow-up can, can be helpful more, more for the surgeon than the patient. Recovery time, right? Even though we're doing these on an outpatient basis, it is still a big operation. And so, Generally, we are sending more and more people home the same day, but it can still take several weeks to recover. We'll get you going with physical therapy, home health, and then you know, full recovery, you know, getting to the point that you forgot you even had any replacement or the hip replacement done, can take several months, if not a, a half year to a full year. Um, and again, the, the goal of the joint replacement surgery is to get you back to doing the things that you love, right? And so. There are certain things that are better for the new joint than, than others. And so walking, driving, biking, golfing, all those things are, are fair game. What we have concerns with are excessive high impact activities on the joints. Can you physically do things like skiing, running, kickboxing? Yes, absolutely you can. I have plenty of patients that do that. But understand that the joint replacement doesn't necessarily last forever. The parts don't exactly last forever. We have excellent survivorship, you know, 90% at 20 years and, and a lot of recent studies. But in order to slow down the wear rates of the metal on the plastic, we try to rec discourage the use of high impact activities, even though physically, yes, you can do these things. And that's all I had. Any questions? Well, like I said, um, Feel free to submit any questions at the uh, on our Facebook page, and uh, I'll be more than happy to answer them. Thanks. Have a great day.